Hello and welcome to another Zosin session. How about that? So I was browsing Code Forces, uh, not Code Forces, but Code Wars the other day, and I found a pretty interesting problem that I think would be perfect for solving in Haskell. I think it was something about Cola or something. Yeah, the double Cola. Yes, 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 that, that one. So um, I'm going to put it in the description. Um, Mm, double uh, double cola problem on code wars there we go so you can find this problem in here if you want also want to solve it so uh let's read the description uh sheldon leonard penny rajesh and howard are in the queue for a double color drink vending machine there are no other people in the queue the first one in the queue sheldon buys a can uh drinks it and doubles the resulting two Sheldons, uh, the resulting two Sheldons go to the end of the queue. Then the next in the queue, uh, Leonard, uh, buys a can, drinks it, and gets to the end of the queue as two Leonards, and so on. Uh, for example, Penny drinks the third uh, can of cola, and the queue will look like this. Okay, so we have Rajesh Howard, two Sheldons, two Leonards, and two Pennies. Anyway, uh, write a program that will return the name of the person who will drink the nth cola. Okay, so this is actually pretty cool. Uh, it's a relatively simple problem because you can essentially simulate it, right? And uh, the simulation is going to be the solution. So uh, you have uh, a queue of names, right? So then you take the name, you put two of these names at the end right so then uh you take the next name and you put two of these names at the end and you repeat this process n times essentially and then uh you get the uh the, the top name and that's the answer essentially uh but here's the thing um as far as I know, n can be uh, as high as the biggest number uh, your language of choice support, right? So we can apply uh, already right away some uh, sort of optimization, right? So essentially, the, the problem here is that each name uh, grows exponentially. The entire queue grows exponentially because every time... Um, you take uh, a person, it doubles, then you have two of this person, and when, once you reach two of these persons, uh, two of these people, right, the, the plural, plural of person in English is, is people, right, uh, they will also double, so you will gonna, uh, you're going to end up with four Leonards. So one of the optimizations we can do is basically simulate the queue not with individual uh, people, but with the groups of people with the same name, right? Because they're, the names usually go continuously anyway, right? So uh, the way we can do that, uh, let's actually bring the queue back. Um, so we can actually apply all of the undos so we can get the original queue. I think this is the original queue. So essentially at the beginning, uh, you have only one uh, of each people, right? Like this one of each people i wonder if i could actually make some sort of a macro so it was a little bit faster anyway so then uh when we take that person that group of people we put them at the end uh, of the queue and double their number right then we take another person uh, get them to the end and double that number and so on and so forth and um so essentially, um, the size of the queue stays pretty much the same. It's just the number of groups within the queue grows exponentially. So, and then uh, we can um, sequentially subtract the amount of people in those groups until n becomes uh, zero, right? And uh, this is basically the place where we stop and get the top person at the queue, and that's the answer. So that's basically um how you can solve all of that right so this is the basic optimization and it doesn't really matter if n is going to be as high as the biggest number in our specific language right so we essentially compress the queue effectively we're applying rle compression on the queue right so that's basically what it is it's uh, rle compression run length encoding compression uh where essentially if you have this like uh long strides of 
repeating characters, you compress them with uh, the amount of characters and that character, right? So here you have uh, 12 Ws and one B and so on and so forth. And you, you decompress it, it's going to be like literally 12 Ws and so on and so forth. So basically we all e-compress our queue to optimize the space and time. Right, so you can look at it as fancy as this. Uh, so run length encoding. So I'm going to put this thing in the description for anyone who's interested. So encoding this kind of stuff in Haskell would have been actually freaking perfect. You know why? Because Haskell is lazy. It is lazy. So we can generate an infinite queue of people, right? So... Um, since I, again the Haskell is lazy it allows you to have infinite data structures and the way it allows you to have infinite data structures is that they are not always evaluated completely they get evaluated as soon as you try to access the elements of the data structure so in here we can have an infinite list of of the queue of the of the groups of people and we can just basically take elements from that infinite queue until we ran out of n and then we can return the answer right so this kind of stuff is actually perfect for for, for haskell so let's actually see how you you would solve uh, something like this in haskell so i'm gonna do something like I don't know, I'm gonna go to sorting. Do we have code wars? We do have code wars. I have a couple of problems in here. Uh, so let me put a double cola, right? A double cola, uh, main.hs. And um, I don't think it actually opened anything. There we go. So now we have a main.hs. So then I'm going to do something like this. And um, do I need to create an entry point? I'm gonna create an entry point just in case. Uh, right, so I'm gonna just say undefined, so I'm not gonna define the entry point. Let's try to compile it. Uh, Haskell mode function, how to set up Haskell interaction mode. Huh. Uh, that's really strange. I don't remember having problems like that. So, interaction mode. Uh, interactive mode with them. Um, I think something broke in my Emacs. I need to restart Emacs. <laughs> so, <laughs> Emacs is, everybody knows that it's an operating system. So if anything breaks within Emacs, you just restart it as any operating system, right? So, uh, yeah, can I now, there we go. Now it allows me to run this thing. So I knew that there's something wrong with Emacs. Right, and we need to wait a, a little bit until it loads up the uh, the Haskell ripple completely. Right, usually for the first time when I run it on my machine, it's a little bit slow. I don't know why, maybe I have a very slow hard drive or something like that. There we go, so now we have Haskell. <laughs> very fast language, as you can see. So we can have one plus one, there we go, so here's two. So let's actually grab the list of names. Right, so we're gonna have names and here are the names. Uh, I might as well actually grab them from here. So a boom uh, and names is going to be equal to something like this. Uh, can we indent please everything? Thank you so much. All right. So if you take a look, here are the names. As already mentioned, I would like to actually uh, apply the compression to the queue. So let's define a type called groups. Uh, actually group, right? A single group. So I'm going to define group probably as... Um, a pair, right, as a pair which accepts integer, which is the amount of people in the group and the name of the person. So maybe it would make sense to actually make it as some sort of a record, like a group uh, size. Here's the group size. And then, um, so group name, uh, there we go. Uh, can it actually, okay, so it uh, auto indented everything. And also let's derive show so we can print this uh, data structure in the, in the repo. Right, so, and the next thing I wanna do, I wanna actually turn uh, each individual name in here into a group, right? So uh, I'm gonna map. So initially we have only one person for each group. So we're gonna map it with group one and uh, there we go, we've got the groups. So here are the groups. So the first group uh, name is Sheldon and we have only one person in that specific group. The next one is Leonard and so on and so forth. So uh, one of the things, one of the operations that we're probably gonna do on a group is doubling the group. So it would be nice to have um, something like double group. 
right double group uh, which accepts a group and doubles its size right so let's actually get the size and the name um, right so this is gonna be size this is gonna be the name and return size but double doubled doubled uh, Gropu. What is a Gropu? <laughs> Alright, so here is the operation that just doubles the size of the group. So, and if you have a group and you map it with double group, right, uh, you map it with double group, as, as you can see, each group has been uh, doubled, right? So, if I do that two times, right, uh, double group, double, double group, right? So, we're gonna have four of them. So, you see, each group has the size of four. So, let's now generate the infinite data structure so we're gonna apply a trick that is called uh, I think it's called core recursion where you have not a function that calls itself but a data structure like an actual value that is that is defined in terms of itself right so the classical example in Haskell of this core recursion is the um, infinite list of Fibonacci numbers right um, Fib, uh, yeah, let's actually Google Haskell Fib, Fibonacci sequence. Um, mm, 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 so infinite, using the infinite list of Fibonacci numbers. Yeah, there we go. So the infinite list of Fibonacci numbers in Haskell is defined like this. Right, so this is the list. You see, this is not a function, this is straight up final list. But this is a list that is defined in terms of itself. Right. And if you try to uh, use that list, uh, it will infinitely generate uh, Fibonacci numbers. But you can always take, for example, 10 elements from that list. And here are first 10 elements of the Fibonacci numbers. So uh, basically that infinite list is not evaluated until uh, you actually request for for the elements. Right. So I actually made a video on this kind of like... Uh, you know infinite list technique in Haskell and I use that technique to solve dynamic programming problems uh, you can find this um, you know my, my video on my main channel so let's actually find Sodin where is it so yeah this is this is the one this is the video where I explained everything so I'm gonna put it in the uh, in the description um, all right, uh, my video on dynamic programming in Haskell. Right, so I was actually looking at the 10th day uh, advent of code problem, which involved dynamic programming, and I actually solved it in Haskell without using arrays or, um, or maps, only infinite lists and stuff like that. There's also another cool video on that specific topic from Computer File. Um, so just a second, Computer file to the infinity and beyond i think uh, in infinity i think that's what it's called yeah infinity infinite data structure to infinity and beyond right so they actually explained uh this thing quite well uh computer file uh video on infinite data structures in haskell so i also recommend to watch this one as well so it's a pretty good video. Uh, anyway, we're going to use the same technique to actually generate an infinite list uh, of this queue, right? An infinite list of this queue. So uh, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to treat this as the initial value, uh, as the initial head of the queue. So all of the uh, names, uh, all of the groups with one initial, initial people. Then we're going to concatenate it with the mapping of the groups themselves right of the group themselves where we basically double them right there we go so this thing basically keeps iterating over itself and keeps doubling itself that's what it's doing literally it keeps iterating over itself and doubling so um yeah um, let's actually take a look at it. So I'm not going to run it uh, as it is. Uh, I'm going to just try to take, let's say, 10 elements from the, uh, from the groups. And as you can see, um, maybe it would be actually a little bit nicer if the group was... Uh, maybe after we mapped it, we, uh, after we take 10 elements, we can uh, basically uh, take the group sizes, right? 
and here they are so we initially we had five people and here is the next five people by doubled right and then if we take more elements from here yeah there we go so this is the infinite data structure that keeps growing keeps doubling itself and it keeps uh, evaluating itself as uh, long as you try to take elements from it so that's basically uh, the infinite data structure data structure that we can use to solve the problem uh, okay so the next thing we need to do we need to be able to uh, tell who's going to be the nth person right so let's implement a function that essentially uh, accepts the integer the n and will return us the name of the nth person it's going to iterate over the groups uh, right it will iterate over the groups and tell us the name so maybe it's going to actually also accept the groups so it will be a little bit easier for us to test this kind of stuff uh, right so um, here's an interesting thing what's gonna happen if we ran out of groups well if we pass groups that should never happen because it's an infinite list so this kind of case uh, will never happen so it's unreachable and furthermore uh, what's the limitations the input data consists of array which contains at least one name so it should uh, contain at least one name uh, so yeah and n i suppose should be less um than amount of people in, in any case i think we, we can mark this particular case as unreachable because i don't think it's ever going to happen according to the constraints of the problem itself so let's not think about it too much all right so then uh we have the n and we have um the size of the particular group and the name uh, of the of that group specifically so here we have two situations right the first situation is when uh n is um, Mm -mm -mm -mm. is less than the size of the group right so you have a particular group right you have a particular group so here are the people in that group maybe i should actually put it in under the comment right and n um is let's say so the one two three four five six seven and let's say that n in our case is going to be four right so that means if n is less than uh, the size of the group that means the answer is straight up name so if n is seven right so i think it should also be equal because we're counting from one yeah, yeah we're counting from one so if it's equal to the size also it, we should rename and basically stop the entire recursion right otherwise otherwise uh what do we have otherwise we have to uh, call nth recursively we have to subtract the size of the group um, right and so here we have the rest uh, of the queue and apply to the rest of the queue so as you can see we're taking uh, the first group checking if we should stop the recursion right and uh, if we stop the recursion we just return the name of the group if not we call nth again reducing the n like chopping off the uh, size of the group from the n and then continue iterating over the queue so that's basically the solution if i understand correctly so here we have this original list and so the first uh, person the, uh, that drinks the first color should be Sheldon. Let's actually uh, test it out. So we have to put one here and the groups. And there we go. We have a Sheldon in here. So the 52nd one should be Penny. All right. So 52nd one is Penny. Okay. And the 10,010th uh, uh, should be Hort. So let's do nth uh, groups and uh this is hard so basically we solved this entire problem in haskell and that was actually pretty straightforward so this entire problem fits into the paradigm of haskell right so you just generate an infinite data structure and you just chop enough things from that infinite data structure that's actually pretty cool unfortunately unfortunately you can't solve this specific problem in haskell <laughs> it would have been so perfect for haskell but you just can't use Haskell to solve it. So uh, I think, I don't know if any of these languages support uh, infinite data structure as, as well as Haskell. You can certainly emulate 
um, infinite data structure in some of these languages. So in Python, you can probably use generators or something like that, but uh, I don't know. So Clojure, as far as I know, it does have infinite data structures. So let me let me see. So Clojure, lazy. I remember it having something. Uh, yeah, so laziness. Let's take a look at laziness. Okay, so Clojure is not a lazy language. However, Clojure supports lazy evaluated sequences. And this is precisely what we're using here. We're using lazy evaluated sequences to generate an infinite data structure. Uh, so, oh, this is a straight up classical Fibonacci example, isn't it? Right, yeah, you, you're defining, okay. Um, that's really funny. Okay, so this is basically what it is. And then you take in, so this is precisely the example I was talking about. Maybe we can try to solve that in closure. Huh. Can we try to solve that in closure? That would be actually kind of pogue. I haven't programmed in closure for quite some time already. I programmed in, in it when it only came out a long time ago. I just poked at it. It was eh, kind of cool. And then I forgot about it. I'm not a really big fan of JVM languages or, you know, JavaScript preprocessors or anything like that. And also it's a dynamic language, so I don't know. Mm. Well, we can try. So uh, we can try to translate this solution to Clojure. So uh, so this is a Clojure doc. Um, I suppose I'm going to leave the link uh, to these documents in the description for anyone who's interested. Laziness in uh, Clojure. Right, laziness in closure. There we go. Uh, and uh, so let's uh, go. Let's try to install closure. Um, let's see. Uh, get started. Get started. Closure installer CLI tools. Okay, so on Linux you have to use a kind of sus install script. Uh, oh yeah, I remember that in Clojure you're supposed to use something called like a Lenin gay or something. Yeah, yeah, you're supposed to use some something like this. But I remember having a, like a pretty bad experience with Lenin gay. Uh, so because it's very 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 slow and it's just like you wait half of an hour for it to download itself and then the closure and just compile something so and i don't really need any dependencies because i think this thing is a package manager right so i just want to solve a problem and delete closure from my computer forever so i'm gonna just download the the, the closure compiler or interpreter and nothing else so is there any way to just download the tarball and just install it on my machine myself um don't really see any way to do that. So I guess we can try to download this script, this sus script, and see what this sus script is doing. Um, okay, so uh, excuse me. Oh, eh, maybe I'm gonna do wget. Let's actually do wget. I think it's gonna be a little bit better. Uh, okay, so what is this sus script is doing? So it tries to install it to user local, which is fine, I guess. This is precisely where you install all of the things that are not part of your Linux distribution usually. So can I customize the prefix installation? Uh, I can. So there is a dash dash prefix and it will, I suppose, install everything there. And here is the tarball, freaking. <laughs> uh, this, here is the tar tarball. Um, so and installing uses install and some other shit. Uh, okay, could have just, but I mean it's it's doing some additional stuff. So it's using install. I think install also transforms something or whatever. Oh yeah, they they're using. Okay, so they're also replacing something within the stuff inside of the exec. Okay. Anyway, let's let's use this SAS script. So what I usually do, I don't install this kind of shit globally in user local, right? I usually install this kind of shit to my home folder and I have a special folder within the home folder called OPT. And uh, yeah, I usually put everything like in here specifically for, for the user. So I'm gonna create a folder called closure, right? And let's go back here. And uh, so what, what's the interpreter? You have to use bash in here. Um, okay, and so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna actually maybe add executable permission for this thing, and I'm gonna do Linux uh, prefix home opt closure. 
Okay, so let's see if it's going to do anything. So it's downloading the stuff. Uh, and then it installed everything correctly. Would you look at that? It actually installed everything correctly. My God, the script actually worked. Isn't that amazing? I think it's goddamn amazing. The technology went so far and so deep. Uh, okay, so we have the closure executables and whatnot. Uh, the prefixes, so they're using the prefixes uh, as we as we expected. So uh, where are the jar jar files? So here are the jar jar files. Do, do I even have a Java? Uh, do I even have a Java? So it's, it actually takes some time to load it up. So that means I do in fact have Java. So what's the version of this Java? <laughs> Uh, it's an open JDK. It's a very old one. I guess open JDK is fine. I'm not trying to run a Minecraft in here or anything. So I guess I guess that's gonna be fine. So uh, let's go, Uvu. Um, so I'm gonna go here. Um, code wars, right? So this is a code wars double cola, and maybe I wanna actually add the um, closure stuff to the path if you know what I'm talking about right well, maybe I want to actually add it to the path so let's export export path uh, right so and in here we're gonna do home uh, opt closure bin and then the rest of the path okay so let's do uh, CLJ um, so it will take some time because it's a JVM language right uh, it's obviously faster than Haskell because Haskell doesn't have a, such a cool JIT optimized interpreter. Um, oh, it's downloading additional shares. Okay, <laughs> so just downloading one tarball was not enough. You, oh, okay, so that was faster than than I expected. Okay, so can, can I do uh, one plus two? Oh, okay, I can. So we have closure. Would you look at that? We just installed Clojure and we can do shit in it. Holy shit, my god. Uh, all right, so if I go to the description, right, so here is the laziness in Clojure and I want to actually test that specific, that specific example. All right, so can I just take this infinite Fibonacci number sequence and just pass, paste it in here? It, it actually just worked, okay. So what's the next one? Can I take like a 10 elements from the Fibonacci sequence? Uh, is that a thing I can do? I can. Disgusting. It just works. I hate. All right. So, um, ah, fuck. I accidentally exited Team Mux. So I need to go back to here. Uh, code worse, uh, double cola. So then also I want to export the closure. Let me actually restart Emacs from within the uh, this environment so I can have an access to closure or something like that. Um, right. So and so let's create something like I think I even have uh, the closure mod from the from the old days when I was programming in this thing. So I guess that's that's fine. So can we just translate uh, this kind of thing uh, to closure or something? So for instance, I have oh, I want to have a list of names, right? So I suppose you define it uh, maybe like this, right? Maybe just names. And in here, I want to say that I want to have um, a lazy sequence, right? So lazy sequence. Is there any way for me in Clojure to just uh, have a help for a lazy sequence, right? So is there something like help, uh, right? So on result simple help. You cannot just check for help for specific symbols. All right. So a lazy sequence. Uh, can you take value macro uh, at compilation? Okay. So uh, lazy sec. And uh, I'm going to take these names, right? I'm going to take these names and I suppose I have to put them like this, but I also have to probably re uh, remove the commas because it's a lisp. In a lisp, you're not supposed to have commas, right? So, and in here, if I define this thing, is it going to work? And if I take a look at this thing, I cannot be cast to string IFN. So I suppose, uh, is that what you want? Um, module loader app i don't know what it wants for me so yeah it doesn't really work that well unfortunately so let's find the closure lazy sec documentation i, I want to find the definition and just see uh, some examples and what does it mean take a body of expressions that returns uh isec or nil and yields a 
uh, a sackable, <laughs> the fuck is sackable object that will invoke the body only the first time. Uh, sack and cold. Okay, so all right. Uh huh. So you have to do that like within the um, within the function. So the lazy sack, if I understand correctly, should be paired with the function because it invokes this expression, right? Uh, takes a body that returns a sack or nil and yields a sackable object that will invoke the body only first time. Uh, sack is called and will catch the result and return it all subsequent sack calls. Uh, all right, so when a sackable is something like, um, so if I have a list, right, so I think I, I can have lists like that. Can I? Yeah, yeah, I can. And it ignores commas. So this is actually very interesting about closure. It ignores commas, which is something like, which is kind of annoying in other lists because you have a habit of having a comma right and here you can just ignore that so can you just sec on this thing and uh well i, I guess i guess you can so um anyways so maybe in this particular case we don't really need this kind of thing uh right so i don't think names have to be lazy right and we, we can try to transform them into like non-lazy list so this is basically what we want here so here are our names right uh and i wonder if there is an easy way for me to just interpret this entire thing uh so clj uh what is that what is that main clj uh is deprecated uh use of minus a with closure main is deprecated use minus m instead you know what's funny i never used neither minus a nor minus m so i have no idea what this thing is talking about so excuse me <laughs> so and what's the difference between like clj and closure for instance if i just run this thing they, they do the same apparently clj and closure do the same thing isn't that cool i think that's pretty cool so if i do closure on main clj uh it still says that thing and it doesn't allow me to to do anything okay clj ripple load file how do you load the file into my thing so there is a load file um so i'm gonna clj mm, so and then i i just want to load file uh main clj right so and now i have names and names is just that okay cool so now i'm getting the gist of it i'm getting the hang of it uh so the next thing we want to do we want to define uh the groups right so uh let's do that groups is basically going to be uh, names mapped with something right so we need to be able to map the names we're going to map names and here we probably have to provide some sort of a lambda right that uh turns it into a pair right pair uh the size of the group and the name right so it should be something like this uh so let's actually google so this website closure docs looks pretty cool so can i just search for map in here is it gonna be oh would you look at that this is actually a pretty good website it's almost like a hoogle or something um so yeah oh i do remember this is how you define the lambdas and shit right so and basically through percent you define where the lambda argument goes i do remember that this is actually pretty convenient so if i uh, do something like map and what i want to do from here uh i suppose i want to just do something like one this and i'm going to apply that to the names and is it there we go so i just turned each individual thing in here into the um right into into a group isn't that amazing i think it's got that amazing holy fuck oh my god oh my god uh so the next thing um right so i want to do something like e uh least one uh percent can i actually do something like by the logic if this thing is a list can I do it like that? Nah, you, you can't do that. You have to do that explicitly. And if you do something like this, it is not going to work because this is not a constructor. So you have to spit. Okay, that, that's fine. That's fine. What's the difference between this and this? So I suppose this is uh, some sort of an array. Is there something like type of? Um, right? Type uh, of or type? Okay. 
it's a persistent vector, right? It's a persistent vector and list one, two, three is a persistent list. Okay. Well, I, I suppose in our case, it just doesn't really matter. So whatever. Um, okay, so we're gonna use a list in here. Um, so can I also reload the file? So there was a load file, right? Load file. Uh, do you have a reload file? Probably not, but probably you just load the file two times. Uh, is there anything like uh, special commands in here? Uh, like if I type help. And then we'll resolve help. So by the way, here's an uh, interesting take. Um, so I do understand that different repos in different languages, they have different syntaxes and whatnot. And just typing help into a Lisp repo doesn't help you like doesn't do what you expect it to do and you know what i'm thinking for a good user experience this is just my opinion for a good user experience uh every repo should just ignore their preferred syntax or preferred way of working if the user types a single word help help if so basically before trying to evaluate the user expression I think the developers of Ripple should do the, the, the simple check, right? Uh, very, very simple check. If line equal help, right? Actually print help that will explain the user how to use your goddamn Ripple. And only then try to parse the line properly and do the rest of the things. Because obviously by default when the user sees your ripple for the first time they have no idea how to use it so just give them a little bit of help because the first and intuitive thing to type into a prompt when you see that prompt is help it's not that hard to just add this check and print oh this is how you use the ripple it's not that hard but it will help you uh, help uh, your user to understand how to use your software way better right I, I, anyway so i think python is doing a similar thing right in python if you just type help it will at least tell you that you're supposed to type help and now you can get the help on how to use this kind of thing you see so it's not perfect but i mean i guess it's fine right so i would expect to have something like this you know what i'm talking about right so i don't know um so and if you type help and there's no help you can get in here for sure anyways rant over uh let's continue <laughs> so here's a bunch of groups so group is groups is supposed to be the lazy uh thingy right it's supposed to be the lazy thingy mm -mm. oh and of course i almost forgot uh we need to have a thing that doubles your group right so let's quickly define a thing that will double your group uh, so i suppose we have to define a function uh, double group right and in here i suppose can i destructurize things right away in here so for example if i have size and name can i simply uh, return uh, this thing like that so how do you define functions let me take a look so I need some examples. Oh yeah, the arguments, okay. The arguments are defined in square brackets, I think. Uh, right, so maybe it doesn't matter, but yeah. So I'm just making a bold assumption that you can just, um, you know, just structureize arguments like that. And the thing I wanna return in here is essentially just size multiplied by two with the name, right? So can I have something like that? Okay, so load file uh, main CLJ and is it gonna do the thing? Uh, so macro expand closure, probably you can't do this kind of stuff. Probably you can't do that. Uh, two, 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 two. So let's actually uh, Google closure, destructuring. Destructuring, I, I forgot how to say that. Destructuring and closure, okay. Uh, so, okay, you can do first and stuff like that. All right, that's fine. Using the same vector as above. Uh, 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 um, my list. So how do you destructure my list? So you can do let. All right, so can you do that within the defun? Can you do the things within the defun? You should be able to. 
because if you can't do that that's really sad in my opinion so i suppose it wants me to do it like that is that what you want me to do right um mm -mm -mm. oh by the way can i do vec one two vector oh shit so that means i can actually replace this thing with vector right and then uh I can just do it like that. Okay, so that makes a little bit more sense, I think. Right, so we're doubling the group. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a little bit better. Can I reload shit now? I, I managed to reload everything, nice. So, and uh, if I have something uh, like this, uh, one hello, and then I try to double group, uh, right, I'm doubling the group, and that managed to double group. Uh, can I double group? Uh, one more time uh, boom yeah it, it is working so cool um, seems to be working seems to be twerking um, so and if I take a look at the groups uh, here are the groups everything's okay so I suppose now I need to make the groups the uh, the lazy list right so I need to turn it into the lazy list I was talking about uh, so the structuring enclosure right so do I need to uh, add it to the to the description I don't know um destructuring enclosure and to, 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 to be fair i don't really care much about this language uh, it's just like the only language that basically supports the paradigm that i want to use in this specific problem so i'm going to solve this specific problem and i'm going to straight up remove it from my computer <laughs> so <laughs> i don't really care about it at all so uh so where is the laziness enclosure right so this is how you do that Mm -hmm. Return a lazy so uh, so I'm just thinking. Uh, to, to, I need to understand how we can use all of that. So mm, 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 mm. I think I do understand it. Um, so now we're going to have groups which accepts nothing and in here we have to do lazy sec all right so here's the lazy sequence uh, then we're mapping the names but then uh, we also need to oh we have to do the cones uh, okay is there any way to concat the uh, the lazy sequences um, let me read more about it um, Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. So this is the lazy sequence. It takes the cons and then I call that. And interestingly, I think uh, I just need a concatenation of our nation. So I think I'm going to just search for concat. Um, right. So what does it take? you can concat two lists together and i guess that's what i want in here to be fair i think that's precisely what i want i want to concat this thing uh right so i'm concatenating this stuff and the next thing is going to be just taking the groups uh right How, why can't i spell groups and uh according to the uh, main in here we have to map them with double group I guess that is it. That is the whole thing. Right. So, yeah. So we have a lazy sequence, uh, which is the concatenation of the original names, right? We turn them into the groups and then we take the rest of the groups and we keep doubling them. And this entire thing is supposed to keep, uh, you know, evaluating itself. I wonder if it's going to work. If it's not going to work, I'm probably going to give up on closure. <laughs> so we'll see uh because that's that's as straightforward uh as i can translate this haskell code to closure given the information i know about the closure so i don't really know much about the closure so uh let's load the file seems fine uh can i now take uh first five elements from this group first five elements should be these names and let's go we, we took okay so we got first five names now uh what about 10 names it worked it worked precisely as it works in haskell okay so we can use this language for okay that's that's cool all right so i can work with this shit sure uh so 
<laughs> Let's define nth or something. So here we're gonna accept n. Uh, right, then we're gonna accept groups. Uh, so, and I need to be able to do the destructuring for, 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 the, for the entire thing. So, where is my destructuring? Did I already close destructuring? Yeah, no. Um, it's here. Sequential destructuring. Uh, so, mm -mm -mm -mm. so whenever I'm gonna have a situation when this thing... Okay, so this one looks fine. Uh, yeah. Uh, remaining as all or something. There is like a whole DSL in here with work uh, to work with things like that. Um, all right. So we're extracting n. Um, and to be fair, is it going to be fine? I don't know. So if uh, n is less than equal than the size so i just want to be able to uh, you know destructurize those groups like this right so i want to be able to oh and i do remember so here we have a tailing uh, tail recursion right we have some sort of like a tail recursion going on in here and i do remember that closure had a hard time to do tail recursion because of the JVM, JVM doesn't really uh, allow you to do tail recursion easily. So closure tail recursion, let's actually Google that. So tail recursion, I remember there was like a, even a special syntax for this kind of shit. Um, so it's sort of like a my loop, but there's no uh, function of programming. Okay, so tail uh, call. Mm recursive looping yeah you're supposed to use like a loop thingy or something uh okay and then you're supposed to do a recur uh yeah so jvm is so bad that you have to have special constructions just to do the tail recursion so evaluates the expression in lexical context in which the symbols in the binding are bound to their respective names and parts Act as a recur target, right? So, and then you can do recur uh, to perform the actual recursion in here. I do remember that. That is actually kind of sad, <laughs> not gonna lie. <laughs> so, uh, here are the values. I suppose these are the initial values and whatnot. And yeah, so you basically do things like that. Okay. So, we have nth and we're gonna uh, call them gs, I suppose. Right, and maybe I'm going to just try to do the loop uh, in the loop. Um, can I just do something like n, n, and uh, js, js, because that's precisely what I want to do in here, right? Uh, so you can start. Uh, I, need, I just need a little bit more tea. I just need a little bit more tea. Sorry. So, and in here we have a couple of situations. If n is uh, less than a size, but again, we can probably uh, destructurize the size. And I still don't remember, don't understand how to destructurize the lists. So it's something like, uh, let's stop a bit and look at the further at types as and at. Uh, right. Okay, so the at is basically that. Okay, it allows you to have a head and the remaining. And I think that's precisely what we want to what we wanna have in here, right? Uh, because... Uh, the original list is like that, and then you can have a head and remaining. Okay, that, that looks fine. So, and in here I can have something like uh, size and name. So here's a size and name and the rest. So basically that's what I do in here, right? Uh, so after that, after we've got that, if n is less than equal to the size, I just simply return the name. Otherwise, I recur, recur uh, with n minus size and with the rest. Uh, so theoretically, this should be it. 
right? Theoretically, this should be it, and this is how I can like iterate through this entire thing. Uh, I could probably come uh, replace this recursion with um, I don't know, some sort of like a fold map or scannel, but to be fair, this kind of stuff is just easier to do with tail recursion, right? So we have a little bit more control over these kind of things, in my opinion, right? Uh, so, yeah, so let's see, let's see if we can do anything about that. All right, so let me reload. Can I search? Oh, I can actually search for this kind of thing. Okay, so and it's already referred a cat, fucking damn it. So it's already taken. Uh, so let's call it something like. Uh, get nth right so let's call it get nth and let's reload the entire thing so it complains about 16 uh right so what's wrong with that i have an extra thing in here okay so nice so we have get nth so the first thing we accept is the number and then we have to take the groups Right, okay, so Sheldon. So is it really Sheldon according to the program a problem description? Um, so where is the... Uh, what am I looking at? Why? Is this really a closure? Why is this rust? When I switch to C... Okay, so it reloads everything and it shows you C. But when I switch to closure, this is in Rust. I think this is Rust. This is... Okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, the first is supposed to be Sheldon. So the sixth one, the sixth one is supposed to be Sheldon as well. The 52nd one is supposed to be penny it is in fact penny and this enormous number is supposed to be leonard and it is in fact leonard so we have a solution in closure uh and i'm actually a little bit worried if i start uh you know um did i already solve it uh i think i already looked into it well i mean yeah i didn't think i already solved it before maybe i did who knows i don't remember solving it I only remember looking at this. Uh, trust me, Kappa. Uh, okay, who's next? So this is the names and the R. All right. So uh, first comes the... Hmm, shit. So we have to actually, you know, uh, approach that slightly differently, I think. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, yeah, we need to be able to customize the names. Fuck. <laughs> okay. So is it possible to pass the names uh, like this? Is that a thing you can do? <laughs> so I suppose, uh, right, so we need to do it like that. So it seems to be fine, right? And then I can do groups uh, and I can take uh, five elements from this group. Um, all right, so that doesn't look cool uh what if i add some names foo and uh bar is it gonna work uh, arity exception uh oh yeah this is because i probably have to provide the names here as well even though they're kind of useless once you've used them right so they don't really make much sense uh, but okay mm, so oh, i need to reload the entire thing um all right looks fine looks, it looks exactly as you would make it so it, it just iterates through the entire things so, okay uh and then uh i can probably actually take the uh, the names right right can i use the names and here are the names and they seem to be working they seem to be twerking all right so maybe we can get rid of that so here's a double group here's the thing that generates the groups and uh we need to call this thing who is next underscores does the author of this problem know anything about lisp and what the fuck is like what the hell is that why is this thing under a co Am I will be even able to solve this problem in Clojure? Because it feels like the person who edited this kind of stuff, they know nothing about Clojure. They, they think it's Rust. They don't see difference between Rust and Clojure. What the fuck? Excuse me? <laughs> 
so I have a feeling that we won't be able to solve it even in closure. Um, all right. <laughs> so, uh, and this course, you're supposed to be using dashes. This is a lisp. In lisp, instead of underscores, you're using dashes. Oh my god. Oh my god. Disgusting. Disgusting. Names R. And R, I suppose, is the. Why is it called R, though? What, why? Are you serious? I, I have no idea. It's supposed to be called N. Oh my god. And here's the order. Well, I mean, the order is fine, I suppose. Uh, okay, so here are the names. So this is going to be R. And here I'm going to actually generate the groups from the names. I guess that's what they want from me, right? So that's what they want. Um, and it will just... Okay, so let me let me just reload everything just to check that it compiles. But I mean, it's an interpreted language, so doesn't matter. Okay, uh, let's test this shit. Okay, so what happened in here? What is this error? File not found. Exception. <laughs> all of that is for nothing all of that is for nothing i'm not sure if it's a my problem to be fair <laughs> i don't think it's my problem uh could not locate core init class or core server I didn't think, I think this is a straight. So, okay, people reported some issues about this problem. Uh, so let's take a look at the issues. Maybe they are related to closure. Uh, all right, are they related to closure? Uh, so it's just, it's, I don't know. <laughs> I just want to solve a problem, man. Like, come on, can, can I solve a problem? Um, in the C implementation, there might be an issue with one of the tests. Okay. This was fun, uh, but this is not an issue. I clicked specifically on issues and it doesn't show all of the issues. You have to... What is this website? Can anyone explain me? <laughs> how does this work? Or how does this... Why does this not work? I wanted issues and I just... Like, I'm clicking on the issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Let's solve this in C. I mean. <sighs> okay, so can we solve this in C already? So here we have a bunch of uh, things in here. So um, so this is a long, long. Uh -huh. <sighs> I can't solve this problem neither in Haskell nor C, nor, nor closure. Truly sad, truly sad times. Uh, so I suppose how we're going to solve that, uh, essentially we're going to solve that in a similar uh, manner. It's just instead of infinite data structure, we're going to have a fixed array and we're going to have a cursor that iterates over, um, over the head of that infinite data structure. So we're going to sort of emulate the infinite data structure, but in C. So uh, I suppose I'll need to allocate some memory for uh, like numbers and whatnot. So um, we probably need to use uint64t, right? So this is the size of uint64t because n can go as high as, well, I mean, it's basically gonna be long, long, but long, long is not as high as the maximum possible. So the maximum possible is gonna be unsigned long, long, right? So because then you will get an extra bit uh, from the sign, right? So um, 
Uh, I suppose we're going to use long, long then. So we're going to use the same type as the N, right? Just to be sure. And how many of them I want to allocate? Actually, I, I think I want to allocate uh, as many as the length, right? So this is going to be a parallel array. Uh, right, so this is going to be the length. And uh, here I'm going to just assign long, long. Um, so this is the sizes, right? Uh, these are the names, right? So we have a names and these are the sizes. It's going to be a pointer of this thing. There we go. Uh, so after that, uh, we need to, I suppose, have a pointer to the head. Uh, so we're going to call it head and it initially points at zero. Right. So essentially you have names, right. And you have some elements in those names, right. So actually here are the names with the star. I'm going to indicate some element. So I could probably put specific, uh, strings in there. Uh, but I want them to be aligned uh, at the same size. Maybe I can do something like this. A, right, the next one is going to be uh, C, D, E. And then we're going to have sizes, right? And the sizes is going to be like something like 1, 2, oh, like actually 1, uh, 1, 1, 1, right? So, and then we have a head, which basically iterates over this two parallel arrays, right? And then uh, as it reaches the end of this thing, it wraps around and so on and so forth. On each thing, it just like uh, doubles the entire thing, then goes to the next element, then doubles this entire thing and goes to the next element and doubles and so on and so forth. So this would be the uh, imperative way of solving it, right? So, and to be fair, there is like really parallel between imperative and functional way of solving it, right? So you basically em emulating the infinite data structure uh, like in an imperative way. So anyway, we're going to be doing all of that while um, <clears throat> I suppose the n is greater than the sizes of the head, right? And of each iteration in here, what we're doing, we're subtracting the sizes of the head but we're also incrementing the head uh right and we need to wrap it around uh with the mode of uh length there we go and after that we are simply returning the names at the head so that should be the whole solution essentially well i mean not not really true right so we have to subtract the sizes so we subtracted the sizes then we have to double those sizes uh right so do we multiply them by two yeah, yeah, yeah. so basically we're doubling the sizes and then we're incrementing okay so that's basically the whole process in c in pure c looks fine to me let's try to compile it into i think uh right so it's gonna be main main dot c uh okay so malloc we need to include something like stdlib.h and uh, there's no main, we can make a dummy main. Uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so what's, what's, what's this thing? Oh yeah. Yeah, there we go. It, by the way, it compiled. So <laughs> it's not gonna work, but I mean, it compiled. Uh, so let's actually see if we can, uh, you know, put this thing in there. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. So test and uh, okay, is false actual, Really? I think I made a mistake somewhere. Shit. Shit. So I would presume that if n is, we, we usually stop if n is less than equal to, to this entire thing. Uh, all right. If, uh, oh, I know what's going on. Um, this is not enough to just allocate this entire thing. We also need to initialize this entire thing with once. Right, so we have to do something like length plus plus i, then sizes for i is going to be uh, 1, right? And that should be it actually. Uh, LL, just in case, you know. Okay, so there's only linking errors. There's only linking errors. Test. Okay, it passes. Attempt. Uh, oh my god, it's a little bit scary. Is it gonna time out? Is it gonna time out? It's probably gonna time out. No! It's not the correct solution. Yeah, it timed out. 
so timed out. I wonder how we can make it actually faster. Huh. Why did it time out? Because I would presume that the more you go further, the more it sort of like speeds up, if you know what I'm talking about. The more it speeds up, because it grows exponentially, right? Because it grows exponentially. But there's something weird in here. So apparently, uh, this is not enough. Um, all right, so how can we speed it up? Hmm. Mm -hmm. So essentially, mm -hmm. I guess if you have too many small names, yeah, you can have like a load, a load of small names in here, right? A lot of small names in here. What I mean by a lot of names, uh, a lot of small names is that uh, imagine that you have a list, right? And you have like a shit ton of these things, right? As many as like size allow you. Um, and essentially, essentially, uh, you would iterate and decrement n one by one, right? So you will iterate and decrement one by one. Mm. Which is rather interesting. Right, maybe you can even... Okay, so RLE compression kind of helped, right? RLE comp uh, compression kind of helped. But I think you can make another compression in here, actually. I think you can make another compression. So essentially, if you know... Uh, yeah, you know that at any particular time in here, you have exactly five people, right? If your n is six, you know that you can increment head effectively by straight up the length and skip the length entirely. Okay, so we can apply like the second level of compression. The first uh, compression would be to notice Right. The first compression would be to notice that you have these uh, long-running groups of people with the same name. So you compress those lining uh, groups, right? And then the second thing would be to notice is that you have the long-running uh, groups of the same length, right? Because on the next iteration, we're going to have a group of like uh, twos and then a group of, uh, you know, fourth. Uh, and this entire thing will just keep accelerating. So we can actually skip N not by a group of the same name, but not uh, but the group with the same length, right? And because of that, maybe you don't even need to keep track of the sizes. You can think you can basically keep track of the current like single size and assume that everyone in this specific place has the size equal to to that. And that way you can speed up, uh, you know, iterating of this over this entire thing. I think that's what you can do in here. Okay, that's pretty cool. All right, so, yeah. Uh, so, hmm. It would, still be, it would be still kind of cool to implement uh, in Haskell, probably, right? I guess it would be still kind of cool. But uh, yeah, so now you don't really need an infinite data structure anymore at all. Right, because what you're doing essentially is just, you know, incrementing this value and then trying to find a place within this array. Um, all right, so I, I want to make a small break, super quick, because I need to make a cup of tea, and after th that break, we can uh, we can try to finally properly solve it. All right, so here's how we can think about this entire thing. Right, so initially, uh, all of these things are ones, right? One, 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 one. And uh, we can keep track of the sizes probably like so, right? So uh, it's gonna be a single thing. Uh, we don't even need to initialize anything in here. Um, so if uh, sizes 
multiplied by the length, right? So the sum of all of the people in this specific chunk is the sizes multiplied by length. So in that case, it's going to be five of them, right? If uh, n uh, in our case right now is less or equal to sizes length that means the person is located somewhere within this entire thing so that means we we need to continue uh, like chopping off this kind of, uh, like the n uh, while this condition is true right so here here we have this thing so and uh, obviously we're going to be subtracting this entire thing from here there we go and then uh, Multiplying by 4, by the way. Why am I multiplying by 4 here? Did I make a mistake? Anyway, uh, doesn't matter. Then we're multiplying the sizes by 2. So on the next run, uh, right, this entire thing is going to be 2. So, and the actual amount of uh, people in here is going to be 2 to 5, is going to be 10. So we're actually now jumping um, by a bigger amount of people, way bigger. Uh, so, and then we need to update the head. Um, do we need to update the head? We don't even need to keep track of the head, to be fair. So the head is a non-existing concept at this point. Right, so, yeah, so we don't even need to keep track of it anymore. Um, so you only need to have the sizes, then uh, you just chop in off the N. And at this point here, right, n is less or equal than sizes length there we go so uh and the sizes is going to be equal to something okay let's assume that it's going to be equal to eight for instance uh right so and now knowing the n you need to find where is it located uh within that specific array so i suppose what we can do, we can take n and divide it by sizes, right? We can divide it by sizes. And that, if it's rounded down, should give us the index of the name uh, that we are supposed to return. I think that is actually it, <laughs> believe it or not. So that must be the whole solution. Um, Okay, so it's actually way s simpler in terms of like code complexity than I expected. So basically, the, the problem here with this uh, with this specific task is that you have a huge queue and you need to quickly iterate over the queue. And to quickly iterate over the queue, you just need to apply several uh, several compressions, right? So first we you know, did RLE compression on specific names, and then we did another RLE compression on specific sizes. So this is basically double RLE compression. And once you perform this double RLE compression, it actually goes down to just this. And I'm not sure if I made any off by one errors in here. I feel like there could be off by one error in here, uh, but I don't know. So we'll see, we'll see. Let me try to compile the entire thing. And uh, so while uh, semicolon, of course, let's add the semicolon. So this is sizes. And there we go. so the, there is only linking error. So we're not supposed to link this entire thing. Okay. So I think that could be a right solution if I didn't make any uh, off by one mistakes in here. So let's try to test that. Fingers crossed and it didn't work actually. So I think I did in fact perform like some sort of off by one error here. And the question is how, um, so where is the off by one, off by one? So if you have something that is, um, mm, 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 mm. So maybe we can simplify finding the error by replacing it with once, right? And let's say that your n is equal to three, right? It is equal to three. And uh, when you divide three by sizes, which is equal to one, you get three, right? So, and if it's three, it has to be equal to that, but we are indexing starting from zero right so i can already clearly see that this is 
straight up off by one so you have to do minus one and i suppose that's basically the mistake in here right so you want to do minus one um interestingly enough what if uh what if you have something bigger for example two right and you have n equal to one right you have n equal to one you would divide it by two right you would divide it by two and you're gonna end up with essentially zero uh right which is correct in this specific case right which is correct in this specific case mm -hmm. so this is rather tricky right because n is in the starting from one uh right it is in the starting from one um mm -hmm. Maybe the first thing I have to do is, well, essentially what n represents is an index within uncompressed array in here, right? That's what it represents in here. So, but it's a one based index. Okay, so after we've done all of this, n just represents that uh, one based index. So first thing we probably want to do with n before converting it to anything is do n minus one and only then divided by sizes right so if n is going to be equal to one right you would uh do minus one which will turn it into zero so an n is probably never going to be equal to zero right um probably it actually depends could it be equal to zero at some point no it cannot be equal to zero because um I feel like they could not be, but I think this is the, the right way to go about that, right? So if it's going to be one, it's zero, and uh, then you would divide it by two, and you're going to end up with zero. If you have something like three, right, if you have something like three, so one, two, three, you would subtract one, right? So which will be two, and you divide it by two, it's going to be one, and there you go, you found the correct index. I think this is off by one in here, so you basically do minus one inside of here. Um, so the only thing is that, what if n is equal to zero? Will n ever be equal to zero? Will n ever be equal to zero? <clears throat> so n is always strictly greater than this thing it is always strictly greater so that means the only way it can become zero if this thing is and these things are equal that's the only way it can become zero but they can't be equal because it's prevented by this condition checkmate so it cannot be equal to zero. I think that's the off by one uh, error in here. All right. So uh, let's recompile the entire thing. Mm, okay. So I'm gonna try to test the entire thing. Is it gonna work? It worked. Let's attempt that shit, bruh. And we passed. Cool. Uh, so do we need anything else in here? I don't know. So maybe I'm going to actually compress all of that uh, so it looks cool and shit. Uh, I don't think I can make it even more uh, smaller. So this is as small as I can get it. Uh, so and that's probably going to be the final submission that uh, I'm going to you know, submit to this entire thing. So let's uh, submit. There we go. So this is, well, somebody actually made a sure one, but I guess, I guess our solution is fine. I guess, I guess it's fine. So, and in Haskell, in that case, you won't need any of this stuff, right? So in Haskell, you would basically directly translate this kind of thing to, um, yeah, you would just take this code and directly translate it. 
um, you will just need length and and n then you would figure out the n and then you will need to take the mth element where m is equal to this expression right anyway so that was an interesting exploration i would say so <laughs> we explored infinite data structures in haskell then we tried out closure and its ability to work with infinite data structures then we figured out that the problem is not actually what i think it is and to be fast you actually need to apply the second layer of rle compression and we finally managed to solve it in c so yeah <laughs> that was quite the journey not gonna lie i didn't expect that it's gonna turn out like that i was expecting that it's gonna be like a quick 20 minutes video because I didn't stream yesterday so I wanted to have something to put out on the YouTube channel today so and I was expecting it's gonna be super fast and it wasn't super fast but it was an interesting nonetheless it was an interesting nonetheless so thank you everyone who's watching me right now I really appreciate it have a good one and I see you on the on the next video check out the description um for all of the links that we put in there so do i need to put any any other links in here i think i put everything everything that i wanted so is there any way for me to give you the link to my uh final solution you know i can probably um um you know upload these things to gist just for you so if you want to play with this kind of thing but keep in mind that these are like not optimal solutions so i'm gonna leave turning this into optimal solution uh as a homework for you okay so this is like uh, on, only one layer of rle compression only on the names and your homework is going to be applying the second layer to make it as efficient as the c1 right so this is going to be your homework okay so uh let's actually upload that to the gist so this is going to be main hs uh right so it's going to be a secret just so nobody's going to know about it except you and me it's going to be our little secret uh so um uh, slow haskell solution there we go so and for the uh, closure or, there we go so here's the slow closure solution that didn't even pass like it didn't even compile on their machine or something i don't freaking know uh what's up with that uh, maybe i did something wrong but i don't know it's supposed to just work right the software in 2021 supposed to just work but it freaking doesn't um so so this is going to be description uh, and this is going to be slow um, closure solution right. uh, solution solution there we go so here's this and uh, can I give the link to my solution right so here is my solution and is it possible to refer to them somehow for example via a profile or something there should be a way to share solutions you know what I'm talking about uh so here is the double quote and yeah how can i have a permalink to to this specific solution um so apparently there is no permalink this is kind of sad really there is no way to have a permalink to a somebody's solution in code forces it's a thing actually i think and it's relatively easy so you can go uh, let's actually go switch to english right so um all right so it's low there's a lot of elements uh contests please uh so for instance i can go to anyone's okay so let's just pick somebody and here's one solution and as far as i know this is the permalink to this solution so you just grab it and yeah you can share somebody's solution easily um like this but in code wars um i didn't see a way to do that so there is a refactor um, discuss maybe discuss maybe that's what it is i guess that's what it is you're you're not sure okay so you're supposed to discuss it okay um why are you supposed to discuss it is that is that available like if you're not logged in well you kind of have to be logged in uh so kata reviews groups uh Eh? I don't know. So I guess 
I guess it is what it is. All right. So thanks everyone who's watching right now. I really appreciate it. Have a good one. And I see you on the next video. Uh, hope you enjoyed this session. I definitely did. Uh, love you. Mwah.